Welcome to Celebration Online. My name is Stephen Danglin. I'm so grateful that you chose to connect with us today. We have an incredible service planned for us here at Celebration Online. We're gonna have a great time worshiping the Lord, a great time leaning into the Word of God. And I wanna encourage you not to be a spectator, but to be a participator today as we lean in and worship together. Maybe that means you lift your hands, you clap with us, you stand up wherever you're at. Just make sure you're joining in as we worship the King of Kings together. This is what the Bible says in Psalms 86. I will praise the Lord forever. And that's exactly what we're gonna do here today at Celebration online. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we worship. God, we come before you and we just thank you so much for who you are and what you've already done, God, and what you're going to do in the coming days, Father. We give you all the honor and praise for whatever's going on in our lives, God, and we thank you for the moment that you gave us right now to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Giant 
Well, thank you so much for joining us as we praise the Lord here at Celebration Online. My name is Stephen Daigle, and I wanna welcome you if you're just joining us. We just finished worshiping the Lord through prayer and praise, and we're gonna continue worship Him by giving our tithes and our offerings before we lean into the Word of God. Hey, there's two ways that you can give here at Celebration Online. The first way is by going to celebrationchurch.org slash give. There'll be buttons there that'll lead you through a, a system. It'll give you prompts to let you know where you need to go to set that up. The second way is to go to webcc.info. And here's what's great about webcc.info. Not only can you give there, but you can access today's sermon notes so you can follow along with it. You can also request prayer, submit a prayer request, all kind of great things. WebCC is a great place. I want to encourage you to go there as Pastor Patrick Egan kicks off our new series, Ready, Set, Go. Let's lean into the Word of God together. Welcome to Celebration Online. Thank you for joining us for this worship service, and it's always a pleasure to get to be with you. Today we kick off a brand new sermon series called Ready, Set, Go. And today we're talking about being ready to serve. It's all part of our build up to Easter and how we want to impact people at this pivotal spiritual season of our calendar. Uh, now, as we kick this off, we're going to talk a lot about serving. And I want to I want to challenge you as you're joining us online. The Lord may put it on your heart to serve him. And there are really two ways you can go about doing that. You may decide that you want to, to transition from online to in-person and serve in some of our in-person services. We're going to have a link in the comments where you can actually go and sign up to serve in person, but maybe you'd prefer staying in the online world or staying in your own respective community. So if you'll write serve in the comments, we'll follow up with you and we'll coach you for how exactly you can do that. Now I mentioned today, we are getting ready to serve. That's what our message is all about. And we're going to be reading Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. I encourage you to follow along with me as I read from Mark chapter 10, verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request, he asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right, and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or on my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the 10 other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Who wants to be, whoever wants to be a leader among you must first be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man, Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many." Now we start off that passage looking at the ambition of James and John. And ambition is not a bad thing. The desire, the yearning for greatness or significance is not a bad thing. In fact, it's natural and it's a godly desire that finds its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. That's why Ecclesiastes says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has planted eternity in the human heart. I heard about a man back in 2008 named Travis Fessler who set what may be the grossest world record of all time. He managed to fit 12 two and a half inch Madagascar hissing cockroaches into his mouth. Not one, not two, but 12. And he had to keep them there without them dying for 10 seconds in order to set that world record. Y'all, I could not set that world record. I don't know if you would set that world record. What drives a person to even attempt a world record like that? God has set eternity in the human heart. There is a natural normal and godly yearning within us for significance and greatness that ultimately finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Now we're all yearning for greatness. We're all yearning for significance, but Jesus radically redefines 
greatness for us and how to get here. In verses 43 and 44 of our passage, Jesus said, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. Now, this is very different from how the world views greatness, isn't it? You see, the world tends to view greatness as fairly exclusive. Now, I'm old enough to settle a debate. I'm old enough to have seen Michael Jordan play and LeBron play and Kobe play, and I can tell you the greatest of all time is, in fact, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan himself said, you must expect great things of yourself before you can do them, but that statement it sort of implies a very exclusive and comparative orientation of greatness. Uh, Sir Edmund Hillary, who was a great mountaineer, climbed many mountains, one of the first to scale Mount Everest, said people do not decide to become extraordinary. They decide to do extraordinary things. But here's the problem. What if mountain climbing isn't your thing? What if instead of being six foot six, 27 years old, in your prime, can slam dunk a basketball goal from the foul line, you're five foot ten, 40 years old, overweight, and you can barely even shoot a basketball from the foul line? Where are you going to do then? Well, Jesus made greatness accessible to all of us. His definition is different. Jesus' definition of greatness is revolutionary because it changes the barrier from can't to won't from ability to humility. It's no longer about what you can do and what you can't do. It's now about what you're willing to do. It's about who you're willing to serve, how you're willing to serve, greatness, significance. It all revolves around your willingness, your humility to serve others. So we need to ask this question, how can we achieve the type of greatness that Jesus himself described. And we're going to give you three major things here today. We can achieve greatness, number one, by serving the Lord wholeheartedly. We need to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. When we look to the life of Jesus and and the way he laid his life down, and, and, and he gave his disciples a foreshadowing of that. In verse 38, he said to his disciples, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering? I must be baptized. Jesus himself portrays a wholehearted servitude to God. That is what he challenges his disciples to have. That is what he marks as the standard for greatness. It begs the question, do you have what it takes to serve the Lord as wholeheartedly as Jesus himself did? See, Jesus was committed to laying his life down in service to God and for humankind. So how do we... How do we do that? Let me give you a couple of things. Number one, we serve the Lord wholeheartedly by serving with our godly attitudes. The Apostle Paul said you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Jesus had the attitude of a servant. There's a lot that we could say about attitude, but let me give you four things here. Real servants have four attitudes. Number one, they empty themselves for others' benefit rather than filling themselves at others' expense. Parents, this is what it's all about. All the late nights, all the getting up in the middle of the night, all the financial expense, all the cleaning, all the cooking, there is nothing your children will ever be able to do to you or give to you that will make that worthwhile. They will never be able to pay you back for that. You have the attitude of a servant. You are giving to someone who can't possibly give all that stuff back to you. In fact, the best they can do is give that to your grandkids. You are emptying yourself for others' benefit rather than filling yourself at others' expense. That's the attitude of a servant. Another attitude, real servants focus on their own responsibilities and blessings more than their others' opportunities and blessings. They don't get caught up in the rat race or the comparison game. They're focused on serving their master. Real servants also see serving as an opportunity rather than an obligation. There's a man in our church who actually got to go aboard Air Force One and cook for the Obamas. If you asked him, he'd tell you it was the experience of a lifetime. Now listen, I'm no cook. I don't enjoy cooking. And when I do cook, people don't usually enjoy what I'm cooking. But I'll tell you this, if the president comes to town and says, Patrick, I want you to come aboard Air Force One and go ahead and throw a Pop-Tart in the toaster and pop it out for me. I'm going on Air Force One and I'm doing it. Why? Because I respect I respect the value of the office and the position. It's a privilege to get to do something like that for someone in such a role. 
Guys, we have the privilege of serving someone even higher than the President of the United States. We have the privilege of serving the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Guys, serving the Lord is an opportunity for us. Real servants have that attitude. Real servants care more about God's opinion of them than others' opinion of them. Tell me who you're trying to impress, and I'll tell you who, who you're serving. And if you're trying to impress the other friends or family in your life, your co-workers, that's who you're serving. Real servants of the Lord care most about impressing the Lord and honoring Him. Now, it's not always easy to have the attitude of the servant. Pastor Rick Warren says this. He says, most people are really good about having a, a servant's attitude until someone treats you like a servant. And that's, that's true. And you can expect when you're serving the Lord wholeheartedly and your attitude to eventually be treated like a servant, and that's going to be a test of your character. That's going to be a test of your servitude. Understand, serving the Lord wholeheartedly means serving with our godly attitudes. It also means serving with good intentions. Listen, it's not enough to just have a servant's attitude. If serving doesn't become something you actually do, you're not a servant. You're not living like a servant. You're not actually serving. James said, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Guys, we don't want a servitude that is dead and useless. Serving can't just be our identity. It can't just be our, our attitude. It has to be something that we do. Part of serving the Lord wholeheartedly is showing up to serve. How can a person be a servant if they never actually serve. So we need to serve the Lord wholeheartedly with our godly attitudes, our good intentions, and also with our God-given resources. Now, a lot of you are thinking, oh, shucks, I don't know if I have anything to serve the Lord with. And I don't know why you sound like Gomer Pyle, but you do. But the Lord has actually given us three resources. Number one, he's given us the time to use in his service. You've said it, I've said it, I don't have time for that. Can I just tell you, each of us has 24 hours in a day. Each of us has seven days in a week. If you're getting more than that or less than that, let me know. I will inquire as to why that is the case. That should not be the case. Now, the reality is that each of us gets 168 hours in a week, and to use one of those hours in serving the Lord represents one half of a percent of your time. Can I just tell you, it's not that you don't have enough time for it. It's not a time problem. It's a priority problem. God has given us this time as a resource to be used for the Lord. That's why Paul says to be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. We have to use our time for the Lord. Time is a resource God's given us. He's also given us treasures to use in his service. Now, studies have shown that the average church goer gives about two and a half percent of their income to the Lord, whereas the Bible prescribes that Christians are to give 10% of our income to the Lord. What if every church goer gave 10% instead of the average two and a half percent? It would generate, just here in the United States, $300 billion for ministry annually. Now, let me give you an idea of what we could do with $300 billion. With $25 billion, we could actually end global hunger, provide clean drinking water, and end deaths from preventable diseases over the course of five years. $12 billion, you know what that gets you? That lets you end illiteracy. It starts adding up and adding up and adding up. And hey, listen, I know it's a political touchstone issue, but I also think, man, if we could figure out a better alternative to abortion. Three, don't you think $300 billion could help us provide a positive alternative to abortion where we don't have to squabble about it in our politics anymore? That could be amazing if the people of God would use their treasures as resources to serve the Lord. Proverbs 21, 13 says, those who shut their ears to the cries of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. We've got to use our treasures to serve the Lord. God has also given us the resource of talents to use in his service. Peter said, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. So let me ask you, let me challenge you here. What changes do you need to make in your attitudes, in your intentions, and in your usage of resources to serve the Lord wholeheartedly? Now we achieve greatness, number one, by serving the Lord wholeheartedly. That's who Jesus was. That's what he did, but also by serving each other generously. As a parent, 
Nothing touches my heart like when my kids love each other, like when they serve each other, like when they're nice to each other. And can I just tell you, as a parent, nothing gets under my skin like when they fight with each other and squabble with each other. It's the most disappointing and frustrating thing I experience as a parent. And I think that must be how God feels about his children. When we spend time loving each other and serving each other, it warms his heart. And when we spend our time bickering and fighting and squabbling, oh, it must get under his skin. Jesus said, but among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be slave of everyone else. Now, I imagine Jesus' words were a little surprising and unsettling to these disciples. That's because for most of us, it's not natural to think of ourselves as servants. We want to be the ones coming out on top. We have dreams. We have ambitions. We want people to serve us rather than serving others. We don't want to see ourselves as servants because it seems to undercut some of those ambitions. And it's a reminder that the line to be served is always longer than the line to do the serving. Isn't that the case? Now, when you think about it, one thing that makes James and John's request so disruptive is that these guys were following Jesus together as a team, as a unit, as a family for three years. They had become close to one another. They were like family, and as the family of God, we need to be serving and elevating each other, not jockeying for position and competing against each other. Paul actually explained that as Christians, we should have a higher level of service and devotion to each other. Paul said, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Our duty to love and serve everyone is clear, but our calling to love and serve one another is even higher. See, as Christians, we're called to serve each other. Now, let me tell you, each Christian has two ministries. A primary ministry where you're called and a secondary ministry where you are needed. You see your primary ministry where you're called. And let me tell you, God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. He has been shaping you from the moment you were in your mother's womb. He has dreams and desires for your life that are even bigger and grander than your own dreams and desires for your life. Now, maybe you have special gifting or passion. Maybe you have a musical talent. Not everyone has that. Maybe you're friendly and outgoing. Not everyone is. These are, these are gifts. These are talents that point us towards our calling, towards our purpose, towards God's plan for our lives. Those things, they point us towards our calling. But there are going to be moments where the door of opportunity that God opens has nothing to do with your gifts, your talents, or your passions. Moments where the door of opportunity is not a showcase for your skill, but rather a test of your character. You see, it's a blessing to serve where we're called, where we're gifted, where we're passionate, but it's also a duty to serve where we're needed. I guarantee you, you can actually come to our church uh, early before a service and follow our lead pastor, Pastor Dennis, around. And one thing you will never see is Pastor Dennis walking past a piece of trash on the ground without picking it up. Now, it's not because he has the spiritual gift of picking up trash. It's not because he has the heavenly calling of picking up trash. It's because as the lead pastor of our church, he has a servant's heart, and he recognizes if no job was beneath Jesus, then picking up trash can't be beneath him. You see, our secondary ministry is where we're needed. At Celebration Church, we have a variety of ministries. And I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in in transitioning to an in-person ministry, here's some that you can perform. You can serve as a community engager, you know, really doing ministry in your community, working with our facilities team or greeters, just acting happy when people come to church, working in hospitality, making sure that everything is nice and neat and orderly, working with our kids town children or or serving in a life group ministry. You're working with our, our midpoint middle schoolers or working on the security team or working with the social youth ministry or technology or worship or ushers and and maybe ministries that haven't even been invented yet. And so if that's you, I want to encourage you, go ahead and follow that link. Fill out the form to go ahead and serve in person, but there may well be ministries we haven't thought of or you want to serve online. Write serve in the comments so we can give you some coaching on just how to do that. Let me ask you, how 
How can you serve other Christians and give back to the body of Christ? That's God's calling on your life. Now, we achieve greatness by serving the Lord wholeheartedly, by serving each other generously, and finally, by serving others compassionately. God has given us a calling to be servants to the world. Now, I hear that word servant, and maybe it's because New Orleans is such a restaurant and eating town. I, I think about the server at a restaurant. Have you ever been to a restaurant that gave you poor service? I know I have. I, I heard about a guy who called over the waiter. He said, waiter, there's a fly in my soup. And the waiter said, keep it down or everyone will want one. But you got to appreciate a pastor who does his own rim shot, right? I heard about a, um, a person who went out to eat at a steakhouse. A vegan went out to eat at a steakhouse and asked the waiter, what should I order? The waiter said, a taxi cab. Eh, eh we'll, we'll work on better jokes for next time. Here's, here, here's, here's my point. The ultimate server is Jesus, and he intends for his people to be servants to the world. Jesus himself said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and give his life up as a ransom for many. Do you know what blows me away? Is when Jesus says this, Judas is in the room. In fact, there's another occasion in John 13 where Jesus is washing the disciples' feet and he's telling them, no servant is greater than his master as I've done for you. You must, you must go and do likewise. And, and do you know, Judas had a pair of feet that Jesus himself washed. You see, we're to serve more than just the people who agree with us. We're to serve more than just the people who are faith-filled followers of Jesus. We're to serve those who don't agree with us. We're to serve those who aren't Christians. We're to serve those who are out in the world. I mean, you think about all these disciples and how long it took them to get to their act together. And, and sometimes I, I ponder, you mean Jesus died for all of these guys? I mean, James and John, they were jockeying for position. The other ten disciples, they were indignant. Judas is going to turn on them, and Jesus died for all of these guys. See, Jesus knew he was sacrificing his life for people who didn't deserve it. And if you wait for everyone to deserve it before you serve them, you will never serve them. Paul said this, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Here's the problem for most Christians with showing that kind of grace and compassion. It's unnatural for us. We're more like the other 10 disciples, right? The passage said, verse 41, when the 10 other disciples heard what James and John had done, they were indignant. That sounds, that sounds a lot like the Christians I'm seeing on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, in the news. We are indignant. We're indignant about everything. We're indignant about politics. We're indignant about coronavirus. Nothing comes along that we don't find a way to be indignant over. Now, do you know why these disciples and Christians get so indignant all the time? It's because we expect people of the world to act like people of the kingdom. Why would they? Christians often struggle to serve others in the world because we have a misplaced expectation for worldly people to act godly. You see, sometimes as Christians, we just don't know how to relate to the world. Sometimes we want to reject the world and escape from the world. And you kind of see that when you see the Amish. They're, they're rejecting the world and escaping from the world. But that's not a good recipe for relating to the world. Sometimes you, you see Christians conform to the world. They, they become so embracing of the world that they let go of their Christ. They let go of their faith and they begin to look exactly like the world. Sometimes Christians try to compete with and conquer the world. They, they seek to use laws to dominate people into submission to prescribed Christian practices that may or may not even be biblical. Some may think that last one's a good idea. Here's the problem. None of that is what Jesus came to do. What did Jesus say? Son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come to reject the world, to conform to the world, to compete with the world or conquer the world. Jesus came to transform the world. And Jesus accomplished this by laying down his life in service to God. He did this for people who did not accept him, and who even opposed him. I want to tell you a little story about history, about Christians, and about pandemics. Early on in the, in the life of the Christian church, in 165 AD, 
Throughout the Roman Empire, there arose the Antonine Plague. Now thought to be similar to smallpox and the measles, it began tearing through the Roman Empire, and it lasted 15 years. A pretty long time, right? In some areas, as many people, as, as, as much as one-third of the population died as a result. But there, Christians were ready with the gospel. They cared for the sick. They offered a different outlook on life and on death and on sickness. You know, when when there's a pandemic that has killed a third of the population, it's a really good time to learn that there is a gracious and loving and forgiving God who cares about you and welcomes you with open and forgiving arms when you turn to him. Many people turn to Christianity and the faith spread about as widely as the plague did. Not long after, In 249 AD, another plague ravaged the Roman Empire, and once again, Christians rose up. This pandemic has come to be called the Plague of Cyprian, who's a Christian bishop in Carthage and wrote extensively about it, but he also encouraged Christians to do what would have been counterintuitive to all of them and to all of us. Uh, Later on, Dionysius described the efforts of the Christians. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, caring for their every need. And it wasn't just other Christians they cared for. The church historian Pontianus explained, good was done to all men, not merely the household of faith. And get this, it's been estimated that the death rate in cities with Christian communities was half what they were in cities without Christians. Why? Because the Christians would risk the danger of offering whatever menial care they could to anyone who was afflicted, and it worked. People were saved, not just their lives, but their souls. In 1527, bubonic plague had set on Europe, and many Christians and others were fleeing the cities where where the plague seemed to spread, but Martin Luther, the great reformer, refused to leave. The decision even cost the life of his daughter, Elizabeth. He later published a tract that expressed his sentiments about the plague. He wrote, We die at our posts. Christian doctors cannot abandon their hospitals. Christian governors cannot flee their districts. Christian pastors cannot abandon their congregations. The plague does not dissolve our duties. It turns them to crosses on which we must be prepared to die. Jesus said, No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Knowing that Jesus laid down his life to serve humanity. Knowing that we stand on the shoulders of giants, Christians who've gone before us and laid down their lives to serve others in a time of pandemic. How in the world do we find ourselves in the middle of the pandemic playing the role of the indignant disciples, those who are just frustrated with everyone in the world, those who hold on to the gospel, angry at everyone else around them, jaded that the world is still lost and in need of a savior and resistant to the simplest of sacrifices that would help to make Jesus known. Listen, Christians, pandemics are our time to shine at least three times in history. A major pandemic has gripped the world, and God has used his people to transform the world because they stopped to ask one simple but powerful question, what can we do? Listen, our best opportunity to impact the world will come from our serving them, not expecting them to serve us. So let me ask you, how can you serve others in your life in a way that will lead them to Jesus? As Christians, we have to be committed to two, the three things, serving the Lord wholeheartedly, serving each other generously, and serving others compassionately. You know, a week before Easter in 2001 is when I gave my life to Jesus. And I never would have imagined there would ever be a job for me anywhere at Celebration Church. And over the years, I've done a little bit of everything, but my first job was working in housekeeping and maintenance. I, uh, if there was a floor, I mopped it. If there was a toilet, I cleaned it. Uh, if there was a mess, I dealt with it. And I think it may be the most important job I ever had. Now, I've had lots of other jobs. I've been a worship leader, an associate pastor, a campus pastor, a multi-site pastor. 
But there's a reason I call that the most important job I ever had. I remember as a pastor out in St. Bernard, we were having a big Easter outreach. There were 500 people on our property that day. And I got a report that the bathroom was a disaster. I went and looked at the bathroom and the report was pretty accurate. It was disgusting. I knew in that moment that if I was going to be the pastor of those people, if I was going to be the leader of those people, I couldn't ask anyone to step in and handle that for me. And I was going to have to do it. I couldn't ask anyone else to clean that up. See, that housekeeping and maintenance job, it taught me what it means to live like a servant. Where no job is beneath you, where nothing, where you're not too good to do anything. See, a servant doesn't worry about placing blame, but getting things fixed. A servant doesn't worry about taking credit, but lets the master take credit. God has called us to live like servants. So once again, I want to challenge you to live like a servant. I want to challenge you to do something in service. Once again, you may want to follow that link and sign up to serve in an in-person service. You may want someone to coach you through how to serve online in your own community by writing serve in the comments. As you consider that, I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Now I know that right now there are people listening to this and your spirit is challenging them to take a step of faith. Maybe it's been easier for them to sit and watch than to get their hands dirty and get involved, but Lord, I, they're missing out. And Lord, I know that your spirit right now is encouraging them and challenging them to take that next step, to get involved in serving, whether it's online or in person. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you will give them the faith to take that step, to step out and to serve you. Help them to serve you wholeheartedly. Help them to, to serve each other, to serve other Christians generously and help them to serve the world compassionately. Lord, I pray that you'll bring about great things that you have planned in advance for their lives. In Jesus' mighty and precious name, amen. Well, that was an incredible message from Pastor Patrick Egan as we kicked off our Ready, Set, Go message series. And we talked about the importance of serving. You know, he said this, he said, show me who you're trying to impress and I'll show you who you're trying to serve. That really stuck with me. And I'm sure there was something in this message that hit home with you. I wanna encourage you to do several things as we close out our service today. The first thing I want you to do is to share this message. Make sure you hit that share button so other people can join in and hear this encouraging and challenging word. The second thing I want you to do is let us know how we can pray for you. You can go ahead and send us an email directly at online at celebrationchurch.org, or you can go ahead to webcc.info and submit a prayer request there. We care about you. We want to know what's going on in your life and how we can connect with you and pray for you in the coming days. And the third thing that we want you to do is we want you to subscribe. Subscribe to this YouTube channel, this Facebook page, to, the, to our podcast. Wherever you're streaming this message, make sure you hit subscribe and also share it with everyone else. Look, we're so grateful that you're here and that you're joining us here at Celebration online. We've got incredible messages to come in the days ahead, and we're so excited about what God is doing and continuing to do in your life. Can't wait to see you next week.